First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the uh, opportunity to speak about the Witten con conjecture here. Uh, so uh, this is uh, so integrable systems is not exactly uh, an area of expertise for me. It's it's uh, uh, anyway it's somehow related to the research area that I work on, which is modular space of curves. And I would like to sketch that relation for you uh, today. So uh, to start with, let me just uh, give you a brief, very, very, very brief uh, introduction to model of uh, Riemann surfaces. So I'll be interested in compact Riemann surfaces. And these are just one dimensional compact complex manifolds. So of course, uh, they are topological manifolds. And uh, so any topological uh, two manifold, uh, if it's compact, can be obtained from the sphere by attaching some handles, right? And the number of handles that we att attach is called the genus of the surface. So, for instance, uh, I have drawn for you two surfaces. One is of genus two, the other is of genus one. The genus one surface is, of course, a torus. Okay, so the genus of a surface is just the number of handles that, that I just mentioned. So the sphere has genus zero. Torus is genus one, and, and then you have the higher genus uh, surfaces, which are, of course, uh, much more mysterious objects. OK, so you can construct a space which parameterizes all compact genus G uh, Riemann surfaces up to isomorphisms. So isomorphisms, I mean by holomorphisms. It, and uh, this space, uh, although it's not a manifold, it's not a complex manifold, but it can be shown that this is a, a quotient of a complex manifold of dimension 3G minus 3 by a finite group. So the action of the group is not, uh, not uh, uh, free. So the quotient that you get is not, in general, a manifold, but it's a complex orbifold. OK, that's exactly what I have written here. And of course, this space also is not compact, because uh, when you look at uh, Riemann surfaces, they can degenerate to, surf to, to some things which are not surfaces. So we'll see that in a moment. Anyway, so we would also like to look at uh, the model space of Riemann surfaces, but with uh, n distinct mark points. So we record the mark points, and we say that two such surfaces are isomorphic, if there is a biholomorphism between the two surfaces, which takes the mark points of the first to the mark points of the second. And these mark points are all distinct. Ordered, yes, yes. And uh, so uh, this space we will denote by MGN. Again, <coughs> so since we are recording one, uh, so n different mark points, this will increase the dimension of the space by n. So this space will be a complex orbifold of dimension 3g minus 3 plus n. Okay, okay. so uh, so I mentioned that uh, these spaces are not uh, compact. So there is a nice compactification due to Dillian and Mumford. Probably the ideas uh, existed before, but uh, Dillian and Mumford wrote the first paper where they formally uh, constructed the compactification. Uh, and uh, so again, this is a, co a complex orbifold, but now it's a compact topological space. So we have mg bar, uh, which parameterizes not Riemann surfaces anymore, but pinched Riemann surfaces. So I'll, I'll sort of draw some pictures in, in, in the next slide. So I'll give you some idea of what, what those objects are. And similarly, we have a compactification of MGN uh, by another space, MGN bar, which is a compact uh, complex orbifold of dimension 3G minus 3 plus N. OK. So, uh, so the objects that this uh, space MGN bar parameterize are uh, spinched Riemann surfaces. So you take Riemann surfaces, you take uh, curves on the Riemann surface, and you sort of pinch them to points, right? And uh, uh, the the uh, uh, so you get some degenerate Riemann surfaces, but 
the ones that occur will have this stability condition, which says that if you take the demand surface, if you uh, further if you take out the marked points and the singular points, whatever is, is left, it may be uh, disconnected, but will have negative Euler characteristic. Okay, so these are called stable Riemann surfaces. These are the only things that occur in the uh, compactification. Okay, so uh, this is a compact complex RV fold of dimension 3g minus 3 plus n. And we have maps like this. So there is a map from mgn plus 1 to mgn, which forgets the last mark point. You have to be a little careful because there may be uh, components which do not satisfy uh, this condition. This condition actually will be true for any connected component of... Uh, so once you take out these points, there will be several dif uh, different connected components, and for all of them, the other characteristic will be negative. So if that fails, after forgetting a point, you have to sort of delete that component and uh, look at whatever remains. Okay, so uh, these are the sort of degenerations that can occur. So for instance, if you look at, uh, so essentially if you look at a Riemann surface of let's say genus greater than two, then it, it is also a hyperbolic uh, uh, surface in a unique way, right? And you can look at the length of uh, any uh, closed geodesic. And suppose I let the length to go to zero, then you get this sort of degeneration where you uh, sort of uh, this green curve gets uh, pinched to a point. There, are, uh, there is another type of degeneration that can occur. For instance, I can look at this uh, torus with two mark points. And uh, so the mark points are distinct, but somehow if you uh, let in the limit, if the mark points come closer and closer, then you get this limit point in the... Uh, in the compactification where there is this bubbling. So you have a torus, but the mark points have now gone on to become distinct mark points on a sphere which is attached to the torus at, at, at just one point. So uh, in algebraic geometry, these kind of uh, pinching points are called nodal singularities. Okay, so, uh, yes. No, no, no. Mark points are all smooth points, distinct smooth points, yeah. Okay, so uh, there are several line bundles on the uh, model space, space which are of interest. Uh, these line bundles occur very naturally when you try to... So, so, of course, why are these spaces important? So, for instance, these spaces are important in enumerative geometry because you can count curves inside uh, inside uh, certain uh, projective varieties by computing integrals on these uh, model A spaces. So uh, these are of natural interest. And uh, there are specific line bundles which are uh, going to occur when you sort of uh, try to count those curves. So these line bundles... <coughs> uh, I, I won't list all of them, but I'll just list the ones that are necessary for us. So first of all, what I can do is I can look at uh, a curve with certain mark points. So this this guy, or its equivalence class, which is its isomorphism class, will be a point in MGN bar, right? Now for every point xi, I can look at the... So I fix uh, one i, and I look at the cotangent uh, line at that point xi, right? And so now I let this point vary. So I let this curve vary and the points vary. So that will give me a line bundle on this uh, model space MGN bar, right? So I'll let you uh, sort of visualize this for a few seconds. And so... I can uh, now look at that line bundle and take its first churn class. That gives me a, a, a class in the second homology group, or, or if I look at C coefficients, in MGN bar, right? So that is uh, given by an... For every line bundle, you can, uh, 
you can get a closed uh, two form which gives that uh, uh, gives that uh, uh, equivalence uh, which gives that charm class so you can also think of this as a closed two form right if you if 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 we if we are interested in DRAM cohomology okay so uh, the other kind of uh, uh, churn classes that we will be interested are comes from the Hodge bundle. So what is this Hodge bundle? So I can look at, say, so again, I look at a point in the model space. And instead of a line bundle, I look at, instead of a uh, uh, cotangent line, I look at the cotangent bundle. And I look at uh, the uh, global holomorphic sections of the cotangent bundle, which is which are just holomorphic one forms on the curve C, right? So the dimension of this vector space is G, right? For any uh, genus G Riemann surface, there are exactly G linearly independent uh, holomorphic one forms. So as you let the curve vary, I get a vector bundle on the model space of rank G. So that vector bundle will again give me turn classes, in fact G of them, and uh, I call them lambda i. So th of course this is not; these are not my notation. Uh, you can uh, find these probably first in in Mumford's paper. Okay. So uh, these are sorry, I don't know why I have numbered these, uh, but uh, these are the uh, classes that will be of interest to us. Okay, so now there are certain geometric uh, classes on MGN bar whose intersection numbers are of interest uh, uh, in, in many different fields, but uh, maybe uh, for us uh, it'll be uh, enumerative geometry. And these intersection numbers can all be computed just from the intersection numbers of the side classes. So the side classes are uh, defined like this, right? And if we know the top intersection numbers of the psi classes, then we will know the intersection numbers of all the uh, uh, tautological classes on MGN bar. So the intersection of intersection numbers of psi classes are of immen immense interest. Some of these numbers were known before, but Witten gave a comprehensive uh, uh, sort of uh, way of calculating all these intersection numbers recursively. So that is the conjecture by Witten. And uh, to state that, let me first define all possible uh, intersection numbers. So let us think of these psi classes as two forms, right? So these are closed two forms. So I can take uh, wedge products of them. And I can integrate this on my complex orbifold. So this is not exactly a manifold, but uh, let's for now think of it as a manifold. And I can integrate uh, a top form on a manifold to get a number, right? And that's how this number is obtained. Uh, so if this is not a top form, then uh, I define the integral to be zero. So whenever d1 plus d2 plus dn add up to uh, the dimension of the space, which is 3g minus 3 plus n, the integral gives me a number, otherwise uh, it, it, it gives me zero. So that, that's how the tau numbers are uh, denoted, uh, so are, are defined. And uh, so let me first give you a, tri tri a few trivial examples. So if I take M03 bar, so M03 records uh, a genus zero Riemann surface with three mark points, right? And up to isomorphism, there is one, only one such, because uh, any two P1s, so genus, surf, uh, genus zero surface is just uh, CP1. And uh, if, you, if you sort of fix three points on the, uh, on the sphere, then all the uh, automorphisms are killed. So M03 bar is just a point. So then, uh, 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 yeah. So then, uh, this number is just the integral of one on the point, which is which gives me one, right? This is just trivial. And whenever n is not equal to three, just from dimension reasons, I'll get zero. 
because the wedge power of uh, uh, the psi classes will be zero. Okay, so uh, uh, now let me give you some more non-obvious examples. So we sometimes to understand uh, where this guy is being integrated or where this number lives, we sometimes uh, use this uh, subscript g n. So this just means that the uh, the subscripts d1 up to g n add up to 3g minus 3 plus n. Okay, so that means the integral will live in uh, m g n bar. Okay, so uh, this is a classical result. If you integrate psi 1 on m11 bar, I'll get 1 over 24. So this, uh, so you may uh, you may have seen this number to be 1 over 12, but uh, here we have uh, some kind of uh, stackiness involved, so I have to divide by 2. Uh, so this number is uh, was well known long time back from the theory of modular forms. Okay, so. Uh, uh, so I can generalize this result. So here I am looking at m11. Uh, I can look at mg1. So that has dimension 3g minus 2. And if you just take psi1, so this has only one mark point, so only psi1 is defined. And if I take the highest power of psi1, that is non-zero, and integrate it, I'll get this beautiful number. So that's, uh, that's uh, I, I, I don't know the proof and I won't go into it. Uh, uh, so somehow these numbers are uh, very geometric. In the case of genus zero, so when I'm adding d1 up to dn and I just get n minus three, so g is zero, then these numbers are just combinatorial. So you see that it's just given by uh, this thing. So this is easy to prove. In genus zero, uh, uh, the the numbers are easily computable. All all the numbers. Okay. Okay. So uh, now the question comes. So I have just given you some arbitrary examples. Um, now now can we compute all these numbers sort of in a in a uh, recursive manner? And the answer is yes. So the, the usual trick is, first let's form the uh, generating function. So I have some numbers. I uh, form this generating, this generating function uh, with variables t0, t1 up to, uh, so un uh, countably many variables. And uh, so it turns out to be, I've written the first uh, few terms for you. So the conjecture that Witten gave is sort of an, a way of recursively finding the coefficients of the generating function. And hence, uh, if I know all the coefficients, then I'll, I'll know all the intersection numbers, right? And uh, the recursion turns out to be a differential equation. The recursive relations turn, turn out to be differential equations for the generating function. And these are the this is the link with uh, integrable systems, right? So let us first uh, define this function u. It's just the double derivative of f with respect to the zeroth variable, t naught. And similarly, I define u dot and u double dot and so on, right? Uh, all the derivatives of u. We will be interested in polynomials in u and its derivatives. So the conjecture by Witten says that uh, uh, this is the, okay, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll get to that later. So uh, the ith, uh, so the derivative of u with respect to the ith variable is just the derivative of a polynomial, a differential polynomial in u with respect to the zeroth uh, variable. And where these polynomials uh, are i are uh, recursively defined like this. So these are uh, uh, polynomials which naturally come up in the theory of KDV equations. 
So this system of equations, so this is a countable collection of equations, right? And uh, this system of equations are, is called the KDV hierarchy. And the polynomials Ri are called uh, Gelfand Dickey polynomials. So all of you must know, know much more about these than me. Uh, so I will quickly uh, give you the first few uh, of these polynomials. So this is R0, it's just U. R1 is, uh, involves U and it's double derivative and so on. Okay. And the first equation in the KDV hierarchy, which is just uh, del U del T1 is equal to del R1 del T0 is called the KDV equation. Okay, so written um, um, sort of uh, uh, gave this conjecture in his, uh, in his paper, Two-Dimensional Gravity and Intersection Theory uh, on Model A Space. So it has, this paper has a lot of mathematics and physics in it. So I tried to read the physics part, but I, I couldn't get, uh, get uh, uh, very much out of it. Uh, but anyway, so what he also does in that paper is that he shows that f satisfies the string equation. So that's why I tried to read the paper because I wanted to know why it's called the string equation, but <laughs> it's, it, it must have uh, its origins from string theory, but uh, uh, I'm not very familiar with, with the notation. So anyway, so again, as you see, this differential equation sort of turns out to be this recursive relation among the intersection numbers. So this re relation is much easier to read than the differential equation, but probably uh, this is much more uh, uh, favorable for computations. So um, note that this integral is on mg n plus 1, whereas this integral is on mgn. So, 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 um, yeah. Okay, so now it can actually be shown that the string equation along with the first equation in the KDV hierarchy, which is the KDV equation, generate the whole uh, uh, countable collection of equations, which we call the KDV hierarchy. So, uh, if you are able to show that uh, f uh, or its double derivative u satisfies the first equation in the KDV hierarchy, then that should be enough to prove the conjecture, right? So that's uh, what uh, it boils down to. So if you are able to show that u satisfies the KDV equation, then that proves the uh, uh, Witten conjecture. So the first proof, Witten gave the conjecture in 1991. Uh, the first proof was uh, by Kontsevich. I think it was uh, sort of, uh, uh, it followed the suggestion of Witten and uh, it, it used uh, uh, a cellular decomposition on the modular space MGN and certain matrix, matrix integrals. Uh, there was also, so there, there have been several different proofs I'm just uh, discussing three of them here. Um, so there was also a proof by Mirza Khani. Uh, this was uh, part of her PhD thesis. She used uh, very uh, sort of down-to-earth ideas in symplectic and hyperbolic geometry. It's a, it's a beautiful proof. And, uh, uh, but of course, the first two proofs, as you can see, they sort of involve, involve tools uh, different from algebraic geometry. So Kazarian and Lando, their paper was, uh, um, I think, uh, published in the same year as Mirza Khani's, but Mirza Khani's proof preceded them. But uh, uh, they proved this uh, result uh, from the uh, very well-known ELSV formula, which we will discuss uh, in a bit and Hurwitz numbers. So the, this last proof, oh, oops, sorry. This last proof only involves, so it, it, it can be completely 
so it, it only involves algebraic geometry. This is the first completely algebraic geometry proof of, of this conjecture. Okay. So, uh, somehow I have been able to convince you that uh, Hurwitz numbers are uh, important. So, let's define what these numbers are. They're very easy to define. So, you can either define them uh, using geometry or combinatorics. So, I, I'll use geometry because I think it's, you can draw nice pictures. Uh, so, let me uh, take a Riemann surface S and look at a map to the Riemann sphere, which is CP1. I'm just calling it the complex projective space, space of uh, dimension 1. And uh, it has the following. So it, it's a degree D map, which is a branched cover. And it has the following uh, ramification indices. So over infinity, the ramification, uh, there are n pre-images. And the ramification indices over those uh, at, at those uh, pre-images are B1 up to Bn, right? And for any other uh, uh, point on P1, I have simple uh, branching, which means I'll have one ramification point of index 2, and the map is unramified uh, at all other points, right? So over infinity, I am allowing arbitrary ramification. But uh, over, uh, uh, over any other point, it's simple ramification. So you can also think of the, these covers as just a, a degree D meromorphic uh, uh, functions from S to C with poles of order B1 up to Bn. That's uh, and 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 uh, ramification. Other critical points have this kind of ramification. Okay. Okay. So other cr critical values have this kind of ramification. Okay. So if the genus of the uh, surface S is G, then the number of branch points other than infinity, so where over which simple ramification occurs, is given by this number. This is a simple application of the Riemann Hurwitz formula. Okay, so the complex structure on S is completely uh, determined by the topological type of the covering. So once you have uh, the covering, uh, so it's a branched covering, so you can delete the points where branching occurs, then it's actually an honest covering, and then uh, you, you know that for a covering, the uh, complex structure is just obtained by the complex structure of the base. And uh, so the topological type of the covering will completely determine the complex structure of S uh, by Riemann extension theorem, if you like. Okay, so this is a uh, sort of schematic diagram for the covering. So I have a genus G surface, which is mapping to the Riemann sphere. So this red point is infinity, where over which I have n uh, pre-images, 1, 2, 3, 4, n, with uh, ramification indices d1 through dn. And there are other uh, uh, points over which uh, uh, ramification occurs. These are the blue points. And uh, there are m of them, over which uh, simple ramification occurs, right? simple branching. Any questions? All right. So. Uh, now let's say I fix the ramification points, the images of the ramification points in CP1. Right, right. So I am essentially fixing the blue points. Then up to isomorphism, there will be only finitely many uh, such covers. This, this just uh, this is this is a, an easy application of covering space theory. So, uh, so this uh, number just counts the number of topologically distinct covers if we fix the images of the ramification points. So these numbers are called the Hurwitz numbers. Well, I mean, 
there, there are more general Hurwitz numbers, but uh, these are uh, these are examples of, of Hurwitz numbers. Okay. So, uh, up to a combinatorial factor. So, okay. So maybe I should mention here that here we are counting each cover. Uh, after dividing by the automorphism group of the cover. So after dividing by the order of the deck transformation, group of deck transformations for that cover, right? So then, uh, so it's a weighted count. Okay, so from covering space theory, you can actually just uh, define these numbers by counting certain uh, factorizations in the uh, in the uh, symmetric group. So that's because if you delete the branch points and the ramification points, then it's an honest cover. You look at how the uh, uh, fundamental group um, of the base uh, sort of, so then the fundamental group of the base will uh, embed inside some symmetric group because uh, because uh, it's the symmetric group of the of the fibers on the uh, so if the degree is d then the fundamental group of the base will um, uh, will have a, a homomorphism into uh, the symmetric group on d letters and you look at the image of the uh, of the homomorphism and uh, then the image has certain properties uh, governed by the type of branching that we specified. And from that, you can actually count these numbers. Uh, so that's what this line says. Okay. So anyway, the Hurwitz numbers are important because they also are uh, Gromovitan invariants. So they are Gromovitan invariants of CP1 in some sense. Okay, so uh, the ELSV formula which is a striking formula, it gives the Hurwitz numbers in terms of uh, some intersection numbers on MGN bar. So this is the connection that we were looking for, right? This is, uh, uh, this is amazing. So uh, what this says is that if you look at the Hurwitz number of uh, genus G um, covers of P1 with this kind of branching over the point infinity, then this is equal to the integral of this guy over MGN bar. So, uh, so this this uh, integral looks quite ominous, but it, it's actually not. It's just uh, the the notation is kind of uh, uh, misleading. So, what? So, let's look at what this integral is. Right. First, we look at the numerator. So, the numerator. It's just the total churn class of the dual of the Hodge bundle, right? So uh, let me go back a bit and uh, tell you what the oh, maybe maybe that's too many slides back. Okay, so the Hodge bundle was the uh, was the vector bundle obtained by looking at the uh, so for every curve in MGN bar, I look at the uh, space of global holomorphic one forms. So that's a vector space of a dimension G, so I get a bundle, vector bundle of rank G on MGN bar, and I look at the total churn class of the dual of that. So that's exactly what I have in the numerator. And uh, the denominator can be a sort of written as a power series, right? So I have one over some things. So I can write, write this down in terms of uh, power series in the psi classes. And then I multiply everything out. Of course, there will be um, monomials which, of, which will be of incorrect degree. So that will give zero in the integral. And the only monomials that will survive are the ones of degree 3g minus 3 plus n, which is the dimension of the uh, space. And so, uh, so this will be a finite summation, right? And uh, because there will be finitely many elements of this degree, and then I integrate them on this uh, space, and uh, this combine. Then there is this combinatorial factor. But 
Anyway, so this integral produces the Horowitz numbers, which is quite remarkable. All right. So, how can these, uh, how can this relationship uh, give me, uh, give us the uh, proof of Witten's conjecture? So I again form a generating function out of these Hurwitz numbers, right? That that's the general trick. That's what we did for the uh, intersection numbers of the side classes also. And then Okunkov uh, showed that this is a short paper and uh, uh, quite readable. So he showed that uh, the exponential of this generating function satisfies the KP hierarchy. So these are also well-known uh, uh, equations in integrable systems, in the subject of integrable systems. And uh, this in particular says that the function h satisfies the KP equation, which is uh, this. So essentially these are, again, um, Recursion relations between the Horowitz numbers. So Kazarian and Landau, they use uh, this equation to deduce the KDB equation for U. U was the double derivative of the uh, uh, gener generating function F. Okay, so let me just briefly say what the method, method methodology of the proof is. So, um, Essentially, if you look at the ELSV formula, uh, then uh, it also involves the lambda classes, right, which are in the numerator. So somehow you have to eliminate those lambda classes and just look at combinations of uh, psi classes. So that they do by a simple combinatorial technique. And uh, they express the intersection of, this, uh, uh, intersection of the psi classes just in terms of the Horwitz formula. This is, in some sense, an inversion of the ESL, ELSV formula. So the ELSV formula expresses the Hurwitz numbers in terms of the intersection numbers of the psi classes. And then you, you're saying that you can actually invert that. So that's what they do. Then, uh, so this relation gives you a simple relation uh, between the generating function u and uh, h. So, of course, uh, it's not as simple as just... Uh, <laughs> so there are some uh, very tricky uh, uh, change of variables that, that, are, that, are, uh, being, that, are, that are going on. But anyway, so these two uh, generating functions are related. And then the KP equation for h yields the KTV equation for u. Okay, so I think that's all I have to say. Uh, this is a very incomprehensive, this, so it's not, this list of uh, references is not at all comprehensive, but uh, these are some papers that uh, sort of came up during the talk, so I, I just listed them. So if you have any questions. what these tau classes were to start sorry, with. Sorry? What, I didn't understand what the tau classes were. You introduced these tau... Yeah, yeah, yeah. These so, tautological classes. What, what are they exactly? I mean, I didn't really understand. Yeah, yeah, so let's go back a few slides. So... Uh, so it's just notation. So uh, uh, I, we introduced the psi classes, right? So, which are just uh, the churn classes of these line bundles. So, these are just two forms. And then uh, I can look at uh, the, uh, whenever D1 plus, uh, whenever I, I have this equality, if I look at the uh, wedge powers of those two forms, then the, those will be top forms on MGN bar, right? And then I can integrate to get some numbers. So, those are the, the, those are the down numbers, yeah. This is, yeah, if they would eliminate what it means in physics. 
Yeah, that's it then. Thank you. Thank you, Chitra.